Six seasons and a movie! The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's the Wrestling Life. It is episode 315. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and still the only wrestling podcast. That's right. You would think after all these years, someone else would have started a wrestling podcast. Nope, still just us. That's right. We just we just passed International Podcast Day, the the holiest of dates on any podcaster's calendar. And uh, yes, we were we were remarking how it's it's quite amazing how how so many years have passed, so many International Podcast Days have passed, but still there is only the first and and still the only wrestling podcast, which is of course our show. Feel a little bit like Cody Rhodes here. So, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> AEW backstage drama is the gift that keeps on giving. It really is. Mm-hmm. I want to touch on that first. Okay. There's there's WWE pay per view this weekend to preview. There's WWE announcer changes and all that stuff. But really, I care about the hot goss. Absolutely. Andrade El Idolo and Sammy Guevara had a physical altercation backstage at AEW Dynamite this week. Who could have seen this coming? These two poking at each other on social media all week. And Andrade Andrade is like this mix of old school and new school. And then he went and gave this interview um, in Spanish uh, for some... Uh, media outlet in mexico i think and uh he took like the the attitude that hulk hogan took in 1993 when he was went did an interview in japan and said the wwf title is a trinket and he only cares about the awgp title Mm -hmm. (laughs) andrade kind of took that tact when he said when he went and spilled all this hot goss about how uh sammy Guevara had an issue with him hitting too hard and uh, he asked him if he wanted to, if he had a problem with it. And uh, and Guevara said no in person. And then called him like a little girl. And then these two were sniping back and forth on, on social media all week. So anyway, at Dynamite this week. Um, there's not... Well, the story that came out immediately to TMZ, which was uh, pretty obviously leaked from Andrade's side, was that uh, Sammy threw the first punch, or shoved and threw the first punch, and Andrade was just the saintly man that he is, was just mm-hmm. defending himself mm-hmm. when he, he retaliated. Right, he might have punches. thrown a punch, but only after the aggressive <laughs> Sammy Guevara came wildly swinging at him right that was the tmz story and that was the first one that got out so you know credit to the very well connected andrade for getting that to tmz first Mm -hmm. but then pretty much everyone else agrees on a different story that um guevara was uh did not throw any punches and was not the instigator and um, so Sammy Guevara was still on Dynamite this week and made a vent at the show while uh, Andrade was sent home. More hot goss. This is <laughs> tremendous. I mean, your it's, thoughts. It's this is what pro wrestling is. All right. <laughs> this is what it should be. <laughs> it's a bunch of insane, coked out fake fighters <laughs> stabbing each other in the back. <laughs> at, allegedly. <laughs> on most of that just for the record a <laughs> uh, bunch of insane people stabbing each other in the back they all have the most fragile egos on the planet and they will snap and turn on anyone in that locker room if they think they're they've been wronged and that's what pro wrestling is what it's always been except for like the last 15 years where it was still kind of that but 
the public facing side of the wrestling business was a t- there was an attempt to to clean it up clean it up and corporatize it and make it shiny and sleek for uh for the purpose of advertisers but nah this yes. is this is what pro wrestling is man like this is <laughs> this is what you want um uh you know the uh, only thing i can say is like yes sammy has a track record of people hitting him now <laughs> <laughs> and maybe if people keep wanting to punch you uh you could choose your words carefully but more carefully going forward but yeah it's 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 fascinating the other element is that obviously the the first thought is well if you don't want to work for this company anymore and they're not going to let you out of your contract punching somebody might get you might, might get you cut and would the other, you know, would other people take you back? Would WWE take you back if you got out of your contract by punching someone? I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. But it's like there's also that element, as you said, that Andrade has. He's got that dog in him. You know, he's he's <laughs> he's got a certain, uh, you know, old school nature of how I think he views wrestling. And how to get what you want in wrestling. And I think so. I mean, I, I don't think it's impossible that he is willing to do things like this because he does not, at the very least, that he does not care if he stays employed with this company or not. Well, it was reported at F4W Online, our website today, that these two were warned ahead of time not to have a physical altercation at television this week. <laughs> and Andrade was specifically warned ahead of time. If you get in a fight, you will not be fired <laughs> because mm-hmm. it was suspected that he was trying to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> Love this. Business. It's, it's very, very funny. So uh, he he just uh, he started he allegedly started a fight anyway. So there you go. Yeah, it's... you know the you know the other fun wrinkle to this mm-hmm. is that uh, Andrade dated Sammy's wife. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> I just found that out. Andrade apparently dated Sammy's wife at some point. Which adds just another fun layer to this. I mean, it can't. <laughs> generally speaking, I don't. I hate to play into cliches of, but yeah, generally speaking, if if you used to uh, date someone and you have to work with the person <laughs> who now dates them, whether you whether whoever ended the relationship, even though you're both now, let's let's assume happily married. Uh, <laughs> Like yeah, I think I'm sure that uh, there's there's a little added attention to it. That is a fun extra wrinkle to this. I <laughs> did not know that either. It's just oh gosh, this is this is just wonderful, and it it <laughs> did lead <laughs> it did lead to a shakeup on the television side. Not for Sammy, who again, as far as I mean, other than you can say some ill advised tweets, did not do anything wrong that would. Dis- in my opinion, that would deserve his being sent home or being disciplined. You know, he's he's winning the main event <laughs> on the three year anniversary show of Dynamite. And meanwhile, they were kind of building a rampage around Andrade's match with 10. And that's now off. And uh, yeah, so it, it <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty great because. What I mean, what else was going on this week? Like nothing, nothing, nothing else was gonna was, was gonna top this. But yes, just the watching it unfold in real time. Even there was what maybe a week and a half between the Punk Hangman promo and then the the presser. It was like the Wednesday, you know, two Wednesdays before the pay per view. He right. called he called out Hangman, and then there's just the week the week or two of regular build. And then there's, and then, you know, the pay per view happens and it all boils over, mixed in with the Colt Cabana stuff. Right. Uh, But this one, it's just like Monday. It was like Monday that Andrade interview surfaced, or maybe it was Tuesday morning. 
and Sammy's firing off tweets. Andrade's tweeting back. Uh, you know, other wrestlers in that company are sort of making vague allusions to it and then deleting their tweets. <laughs> and then, you know, there's like a we'll see, see you Wednesday, bud, type of, uh, you know, <laughs> which you feel like, oh, maybe that's just some internet posturing. Turns out it wasn't. <laughs> Turns out it was, in fact, on site. <laughs> wonderful as you mentioned there's a generation of wrestling uh folks uh, wrestling fans people you know i'm 38 years old people younger than me grew up with wrestling that was as you mentioned corporatized and sanitized and everyone does make a wish and everyone uses corporate jargon Mm -hmm. and they don't remember the boom, the last boom period in this business where Terry Taylor would get fired and hired <laughs> every three months by WWF or WCW and to work as an agent just so he could stooge off to the other company when guys' contracts were up. That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Terry <laughs> Taylor, <laughs> the Red Rooster, mm-hmm. he, he, he got hired and fired like 14 times during the Monday Night Wars. It was tremendous. It's incredible. And it's yeah, it's just one of those little wrinkles of of the past eras of wrestling, of the some of the dirty tricks or yeah, I think there's this idea now that like everybody's friend like there's a it's funny because that was the meme, right? AEW is all friends wrestling. Right. Like, well, everybody's 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 best friend and nobody can, you know, nobody's up, ever upset with their spot or thinks they should get a push that somebody <laughs> else is getting. And I think right. you see that now in, in WWE, especially, you know, uh, maybe not especially, but I think especially with maybe the women's division. Like, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of I think there's a there is an onus on the wrestlers now to project that aura yes. because you don't want to be seen as selfish or ungrateful or the aggressor in a scenario like that but yeah these are still people that are work you know everybody's working hard everybody's working out and putting ring time maybe not everybody but like a lot of people are putting in the ring time and are working hard and are you know working on their promos and a lot of people probably see the top stars or people that are on television every week at least and go that should be me i want that and then you're in this environment where you have to be in the same room as these people that you maybe have other personal reasons for animosity. And then you, you mix all that together and it's a, it's a powder keg that was, you know, unlit (laughs) seemingly (laughs) for most of the last decade, with the exception of like punk walking out. And, you know, there's a story here or there of, you know, like Brian Danielson and triple H having a big blow up or something in, in gorilla because triple H stopped a match or something. Right. But like you don't you don't you just didn't hear a lot of stories like this. I'm sure it doesn't mean they didn't happen, but certainly not when you're there's, there wasn't a backstage fight every two weeks. Like, you, again, you have to go back to like at least the mid 90s for that when you had like, you know, Piper and Nash fighting in WCW and you had Brett and Sean in WWF and all this all this stuff. Or obviously you go back to the really crazy, crazy times of the of the 80s when guys are getting stabbed and stuff. It's a little bit a whole other level but it's yeah it's like for most of its existence wrestling has been about guys kicking and scratching and clawing and doing what it takes and and being jealous and being you know and and talking bad about their co-workers because they want something that they have or they don't think the other guy deserves what they have you know like this is this was commonplace until relatively recently yeah, so dynamite itself this week was just a thing. Yeah, it was fine. I... <laughs> Honestly, I fell asleep during the show. <laughs> I, I can understand it's my that. job. It's my job to be awake during the show, and I fell asleep during the show. <laughs> it just was not an interesting program to me. The National Scissoring Day stuff with uh, the the acclaimed boys. Everyone does seem to love the acclaimed. I will mm-hmm. I will give them that. And uh and Billy Gunn has somehow managed to get himself over in the year 2022, which is <laughs> n- no small feat. Going to be the most over uh, guy so, at the DX reunion even though he's not there next week. Yeah. Yep. 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 And uh we get the big uh <laughs> the big 
Swerve Strickland versus Billy Gunn singles match on next week's program. So there's that. They've been on a collision course. <laughs> you know, it's one of these like Swerve is like one of the five coolest wrestlers in the world, maybe. <laughs> like just based on aesthetic alone, I think. Oh, sure. But yeah, like the way, at... he, way he carries himself, his mm-hmm. work, his look, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And yet somehow he's doing like this complete comedy show with where he's going to wrestle daddy ass <laughs> but he still <laughs> seems really cool during it <laughs> like yes. which i think is a real testament to him and and despite being so cool is also pretty good about getting himself booed so that's a that's so that was it's funny as much as the the haha and the shtick was 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 uh maybe the highlight of that uh for a lot of people i think the best part of that for me was just like man <laughs> this swerve dude's like the best guy they out of all of these nxt and wwe guys that they've signed over the last three years like that's the dude where i'm like wow that was a great (laughs) that was a great call really good job bringing him in he feels like a main event guy Mm -hmm. i don't know that he ever did in nxt yeah definitely he really stands out here yeah yeah good for good for swerve um yeah so uh they debut in canada next week um yeah there's that and Tony Winoki died I was thinking about this and uh, I think someone on Twitter actually came up with this analogy and it was like what if Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon were somehow the same person mm-hmm. um and yet and that like undersells if you're trying to draw an analogy to how big w- Antonio Inoki was it was like tried to think if like if Hogan and Vince were the same person and yet still still somehow more famous mainstream like Inoki is like yeah Antonio Inoki was really over I think is my point <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> and uh, he's been he'd been in poor health for some time when he passed away this past week so uh yeah your thoughts yeah it's it's one of those guys we we chatted about this a little bit off the years where like Vince and Hogan, but somehow even more, maybe because he was, again, kind of both of their jobs, sometimes at the same time. Uh, he's like, he just feels like such a mythical figure. And that's like, he shared a ring. He had a work kind of semi-shoot fight with Muhammad Ali. And that's like maybe the 10th most interesting thing about this guy. <laughs> Right. Like there's just things about this guy that you can't fathom. Like he had a political career. He put on shows in North Korea and Baghdad. And, you know, there's the the story about that. Maybe at some point there was an idea that he was going to wrestle Saddam Hussein. Like, <laughs> like it seems impossible, but also it's Inoki. So you're like, there's, that's, there's a non-zero chance that could have happened. And, you know, and then you think of his involvement in pride and like how that influenced MMA. So it's like he's Vince and Hogan and a little bit of like Dana White as well. And a little bit of and and again, he had these, you know, he had a political career, just like a, a just a complete mythic figure. It's like, yeah, it's like he's all of those guys. And then also he was Elvis or something like he was also. Right like just this larger than life pop culture icon that everyone of, of that generation in Japan and, and even again, other places in the world, he was a a huge star as well. It's, it's really, uh, it's really almost impossible to, to discuss a guy like that. And again, I neither, neither one of us are like historians when it comes to Japanese pro wrestling, but you'd have to be, you'd have to almost have just learned about pro wrestling within like the last two years to not at least have a vague sense <laughs> of who Anton of who Antonio Noki was and, and just sort of this incredible, you know, incredible legacy that he leaves and not all of it's good. You know, he bezeled a lot of money and he almost killed the company he created to the point where he was kind of ousted from it in the, in the two thousands because he convinced himself that, uh, his his pro wrestlers needed to be legit fighters. So he, you know, he sent Yuji Nagata and Shinsuke Nakamura and all these people to fight like Fedor and Mirko Crow Cup and all these crazy, incredible, like top tier MMA fighters of their day. And they, of course, they got killed. And then that hurt them in, <laughs> in turn, hurt them as pro wrestlers, as draws there. So 
like he was I guess in the same way that you can kind of look at the last 15 or 20 years of Vince McMahon as a promoter, like you could see that he was also going insane. (laughs) Like, because I think anyone that's that strong and powerful and has that much success always maybe goes insane at the end a little bit, at least. Sure. So so there's a million things. And then yes, as his, his last few years on earth, as you said, he had a lot of health problems and kind of took on this, uh, you know, this, second life as like a kindly grandfather and i wasn't sure if this was like legitimate or just like what you said like when hogan said that uh he and macho man made up right before (laughs) macho man died but but i know new japan's and uh uh higher ups were all talking about how oh we had made this deal with him and we were gonna announce it in a few weeks that he was like the the permanent like honorary president of new japan or whatever and right uh, and I'm sure there'll be some kind of some kind of big joint show with with New Japan and All Japan and, and Noah and or some kind of big super card for him in his honor. But I'm not sure if that part of it where where he really truly had made up with every with everybody is <laughs> is true or not. But uh, I think maybe that makes the that's that's just another part of that legacy is that he's he's such a mythic figure that now that he's gone, people are are naturally going to want to mostly remember the the positive parts of his, of his legacy of what a big star he was and, and what he meant to, to Japanese wrestling. So it's, it's a, it's an incredible legacy. Um, if, if I had to pick one moment that I've seen of his career, it's probably when uh, Luke Gallows and Sylvester Turkai were having a match in uh, one of those promotions. I can't remember which one. And, uh, and Anoki was so angry that the match was so bad that he ran out and started ringing the bell and screaming the F word and then slapped Masahiro Chona in the back of the head yes. for booking the match in the first place. Uh, just, yes. just an incredible man. Uh, just, just, <laughs> but that clip that, that resurfaced this week when he, when he passed away, it's just one of the funniest things I've ever seen. It, it's kind of sad to me that like to a generation they're only going to know him from that gif Mm -hmm. but also or that video clip but also like uh it's it's not all bad if that's (laughs) if that's the only way people get to learn about anoki it's like yeah at least it's it's screwing one of the good brothers (laughs) (laughs) so there's that yeah yeah it's it like i said it's 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 impossible to overstate like what he meant to wrestling everywhere to MMA everywhere, but especially to, to those sports in, in, in Japan. But it's just, yeah, like I said, it's like talking about Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon and the Beatles all at once. Like right. it's, it's impossible to kind of recap that, that legacy. And you're going to, going to be constantly probably, even if you are a student of history, there's probably going to be, uh, you know, new stuff that you that you uncover about him as you, as you learn about him. As I'm sure the observer will have a big, long, uh, detailed uh, uh, obituary for him this coming week as well. So, yeah, I'm sure there's there's plenty of things that I who you know have have done some Wikipedia deep dives on him and I've seen you know kind of clips of some of his his heyday. But I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that I just don't know about that I. That I look forward to learning, but yeah, it's it's really impossible to kind of just talk about a guy like that who has been so so mythic in in what he meant to every aspect of of wrestling. He's a level of we talked about this off the air too, but he's a level of famous that like people can't get as famous now mm-hmm. as Antonio Inoki was. It's like I was 10 years old. I thought Vince McMahon invented wrestling in 1984, pretty much. <laughs> um, and yet somehow I knew that Antonio Winoki fought Muhammad Ali in the 70s in Japan. Like mm-hmm. um, he's a level of famous, as you mentioned, like the Beatles or Elvis or like people just don't get that famous anymore because of how everyone consumes their media and how everyone yeah compartmentalizes everything and how fractured everything is and it's like you know we discussed how we can look at the TV ratings and it's like oh you know Blue Bloods or MacGyver on CBS (laughs) is in season 6 and it's like I was barely aware that there was a MacGyver reboot and I've never seen an episode and yet 
it's on season six and seven million people watch it every week. <laughs> it's like <laughs> we can, you know, it, it's bizarre. Just the, but he was and Oki was a level of famous that you just you can't get that famous. And he, like, who were the most universally famous people in the world? You know, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like. And Oki, no one in wrestling will ever reach that level again. It's just it's just it's not possible. And the fact that it was because there was no Internet that he was able to get that famous. But also, it's kind of shocking that without Internet, someone could reach that level of fame. And he did. So there you go. Yeah, abs- that that is. Uh, I think there's also that thing of stars of like the not the pre-Internet era. Fe- all feel like more important maybe because yes. you said like they said because i couldn't look up who everyone was <laughs> with a you know with two two taps on my phone but uh at, at that in the, in their era but they just there's just this this incredible quality or maybe there was just there was more of like a, a space or more of an arm's length relationship between the entertainers and the entertainees at, in that era and now there's like a a certain like again sort of incumbent upon modern celebrities i think to make themselves seem more approachable and down to earth so maybe that also in some way hurts the the star quality of him but yeah it's like it's yeah it's like talking about a, a religious figure almost like you're talking about gandhi or something like you just how do you <laughs> how do you encapsulate someone like that yeah it's uh it's very it's very odd but uh i have nothing to add um wwe so they have extreme rules coming up this weekend on saturday before that they announced that they're shaking up the commentary teams this is very much a uh a triple h promotion now (laughs) um there are some there are some moves that I understand. There's some moves that I'm a little perplexed about, but uh new SmackDown team, Michael Cole and Wade Barrett on commentary, with Samantha Irvin still as the ring announcer and Caleb Braxton and Megan Morant as the backstage interviewers. So the change there is Wade Barrett in and up from NXT to the SmackDown commentary team on Monday Night Raw. Kevin Patrick and Corey Graves are the new team. Patrick filled in one week for Jimmy Smith, and uh, there was no no notable drop-off in the quality of the show (laughs) without Jimmy Smith. Um, So there we go. Um, And the backstage interviewers, uh, sorry, the, uh, the ring announcer will be Mike Rome, who uh, has been the ring announcer and uh, Byron is off commentary and back to uh, and is now a backstage interviewer and the returning Kathy Kelly will be a backstage interviewer on Monday night raw. And uh, then the NXT team is Vic Joseph is still the play by play guy. Booker T will be on color commentary. Mackenzie Mitchell is still the backstage interviewer and Alicia Taylor is still the ring announcer, but big changes to all of the WWE commentary team. What do you think? Um, I mean, Corey Graves being on two show, it's just, it's just, was just unacceptable to me. So agreed. And uh, so I'm glad that's changing. I, I feel like if you were really serious about like really giving the show a fresh coat of paint, maybe you would find a non-white, not non-male <laughs> to put on the main commentary team. I guess, I mean, you, you have you have Booker T on, uh, on NXT, but uh, I think I thought for a while that like Mackenzie or one of those women should be given a shot, maybe as play-by-play, because obviously Renee was a great backstage interviewer, and then they put her as the third person in a booth with Cole, who is you know very you know has a lot to do and has to talk a lot and has to call the action and then Corey graves who does not leave a lot for his fellow commentators especially a third color commentator to uh 
you know, there aren't there aren't many scraps left over to say <laughs> to say after after Corey is there. So I think maybe maybe you would try one of them at play by play or something. I just I was just looking at it. And I was like, I think this will be better than the previous setup. Um, you know, Byron Saxon seems like a friendly fellow. Um, he's never been a good commentator, so probably good to not have him on commentary every week anymore. Uh, it's it's the death of the three man booth officially, I guess. So that I guess we know <laughs> definitively now that that was a big a bit big Vince thing that uh, that uh, that Hunter maybe doesn't see as much value in. So at least not if you're not going to have like a third person that has an actual role. <laughs> yeah. Again, like Byron on Raw didn't. I mean, he he and Corey had like a little bit of an interplay, but it wasn't really enjoyable <laughs> to listen to. <laughs> um so yeah i mean i think i i think overall it it will be better i don't know i don't know about whatever he is booker t60 yet feels like it but no i think he's still in his 50s okay so i mean but i mean if you're if if nxt is supposed to be the hip young show i guess it's i guess they got rid of the multicolor stuff but i think nxt is supposed to still be like a developmental show I guess, I mean, I guess that's what they did with FCW, right? And the original NXT, they had like Regal and Dusty doing commentary on those shows. So I guess that's, maybe that's the idea is you just have a, a legend on, on commentary and then you watch the, uh, the kids learn how to wrestle on live television every week. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so no word on. I'm actually trying to find out if uh, Sarah Schreiber is gone from the team. Um, Jimmy Smith is definitely gone though. Jimmy was mm-hmm. uh, really put in in a uh, in a in a in a really bad spot. He was put in a no win position, and I... but there have definitely been worse uh, <laughs> lead voices on Monday Night Raw. Than, uh, than Jimmy Smith. So, well, he was following Adnan Verk, if you remember. So it was yes. kind of all uphill from. <laughs> you couldn't go further down as far as a guy who had less product knowledge or was less prepared to be lead announcer on a wrestling show than that guy. So, yeah, he was fine. But also, if like if you asked me to type up a paragraph about Jimmy Smith. <laughs> two years and, and like to give an opinion on his two years as, as raw <laughs> announcer. I don't think I could. Yeah. Cause I, I, he, I nothing him. I, <laughs> I zero memorable moments. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I didn't dislike him as the commentator, but I also didn't like him as the commentator. I, I nothing him. He was there. I don't really remember him. Yeah. He didn't really try to do a lot of banter with, <laughs> with anybody um so he was just there and he you know he tried to sound excited and he shouted the names of moves that's <laughs> that's about what i remember about jimmy nothing nothing particularly offensive but uh absolutely nothing good either yep yep he learned the names of some new moves like he <laughs> seemed to be wi- he seemed to be willing to put in the work whereas and I don't blame Adnan. Adnan has like fifty jobs, <laughs> right? And if you ever see him, you ever see him on MLB Network now doing. He does fill in work mostly, I think, on MLB Network. But he's like a, a fountain of charisma on, <laughs> on in in his real sports jobs. And you, this poor guy, <laughs> this poor guy, he doesn't want to be there. <laughs> He clearly doesn't have the time to do his homework. Yeah, that was it. That was fun. That was a fun time. <laughs> he was just he was really he was really amazed by everything. <laughs> yes. Yes. So a lot of him like, wow, so they're, they're named the Viking Raiders. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was like he was learning like they hadn't even given him a run sheet. <laughs> it's just He was learning people's names from when they would come up on the on the, the video screen. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's tremendous. All right. Extreme Rules is coming up on Saturday. Another Saturday premium live event. Saturday. Six matches announced for this program so far. Um, We can chat about the build for these as we get mm-hmm. into it here. The Brawling Brutes 
are going to be facing Imperium in a good old fashioned Donnybrook match, which is just a match with no rules. Uh, Sheamus and Gunther are going to rematch their uh, five star match on SmackDown this week. Um, I might put the Donnybrook on <laughs> television and then put the rematch of the five star match on on the pay per view, but we're really just nitpicking at this point. This brawling brutes Imperium thing, uh, it feels like maybe it's run its course. But uh, the people seem to like it, and the matches are uh, are pretty entertaining mm-hmm. because you got guys who are gonna. There's a combination of guys who are just gonna beat the hell out of each other, and a combination of guys who are gonna just absolutely incapable of having a bad match, like like uh, Pete Dunn slash Butch, and uh, th- they're gonna work hard to make it work hard to make it work. Yeah, no, I think what uh, what what's what I I think they had the match at the pay per view, or Sheamus and and Gunther had their match at the stadium show, which was awesome, and then they did that six man the following week, and I could not fathom how into Sheamus that crowd was. <laughs> I don't think we did a show after that six man because we usually put our shows out on like Friday mornings, so we don't usually talk about SmackDown much, but it was like people were so into this for that first week or two. And now it's been like another six weeks. So I think it's like with a lot of things, a lot of programs currently running in WWE that we might touch on in this extreme rules build. Uh, I think people were really, were uh, really into it when maybe it was first coming out, but maybe that, that when they, when these programs started in August, (laughs) And we're just now getting to like the first one-on-one matches or the, or the first rematch of what this match was that everybody loved. Maybe it feels like it's, it's, it's gotten a little long in the tooth. Speaking of a little long in the tooth, Edge versus the Judgment Day. Oof. Edge is facing Finn Balor in an I Quit match. I Quit matches always suck. Mm-hmm. Like maybe, maybe... Because of the spectacle of it, the Rock and Mankind one was good, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it took it took like two of the twenty greatest performers in the history of the business to have <laughs> the only good I Quit <laughs> match ever, yeah. in my opinion. I know oh, there's yeah. the I think Cena and Orton had yeah. had one that people seem to like that I absolutely hated, but <laughs> I was like, yeah, I really, I mean, it's it's they had to. It was in it was in like the height of of the the quote unquote PG era, and so Orton's way around that was to just really hit him, <laughs> just kept really hitting him in like the ribs with a kendo stick to where his his body was where Cena's body was like welted up and and everything. So it's like yeah, it was it was pretty brutal and it's memorable. I haven't gone back to it in several years, but I remember liking it at the time. I I remember it feeling like the watching the passion of the Christ. <laughs> there is a moment where he's like handcuffed and hung over the ring post to the floor and Orton's just wailing on him with the, uh, with the stick. I remember that. That's very, uh, yeah. very dramatic, very cinematic. Yeah. Edge versus Finn. Yuck. All uh, right. They're, yeah. they're maybe teasing that AJ is going to join the group now, or maybe he's going to, I mean, eventually I they need they need Edge and Ray and a third guy against Finn and and Dominic and uh, Damian Priest. Right. Like, so it's just the third guy could be AJ or AJ could turn and then you have a different third guy. But it just feels like we're even though this has been going since like May, <laughs> it yes. doesn't feel like we're wrapping up with this. No. It might be, you know, it might even be going to war games. Um, you could, I mean, if you wanted to do some kind of some, um, not intergender, but a mixed thing there. I mean, they were really teasing Beth getting in there with Rhea for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but you do need a third, you need a third guy on the edge AJ side. So yeah, maybe, uh, maybe Elias will have grown his beard back and, uh, Boy, does that feel not feel like a good fit for this program, but also <laughs> just 
just it doesn't feel like they have a whole lot of feel like they have a whole lot of guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bianca Belair will be wrestling Bailey in a ladder match for the Raw Women's Title. These guys are gonna have a banger, and I just hope they don't get hurt. Yeah, I think it'll be a good match. This is this was something I was alluding to as something people were excited about, but has been basically in a holding pattern for the last 10 weeks or so. Um, I think, yeah, I think it'll be a really good match. Bianca's been put been protected very strongly. It's it's a fun match in that this is Bailey going for the title for the first time since she's been back. She's the top heel on a Paul Levesque book show. So right. it seems likely that she would win here, right. but they've protected Bianca for so long and have done so much to make her the top star on this show um, that it doesn't seem impossible that Bianca could just win anyway. So that that is maybe the most fun from like a actual intrigue of what they do for a finish here. And obviously there will be run-ins with Alexa and Asuka and uh, and Io and and Dakota and and, and probably they, they they added Aunt Candace. That's something that happened well uh, since we last did the show. Aunt Candace came back, yeah, and uh, and she's she's on the good guys team at least for now. So I guess that also means that'll probably be the women's four games match then, right? So so damage control needs a fourth person. Correct. Yeah. Yes, that is that is true. Uh, a strap match between Drew McIntyre and Karrion Cross. You talk about there never being a good <laughs> yes. stipulate uh, version of this particular stipulation. Uh, post like maybe like there's probably like a bloodbath with like Pat Patterson and Sergeant Slaughter or something in the 70s. Like, sure. Has there ever been a good strap match? Uh, I can't think of a good one that I've seen. <laughs> I've I've only been watching wrestling since 1987. So is that. <laughs> yeah. I uh I think I mean it's <laughs> it's not a match I'd want to see as a straight wrestling match either, but really. <laughs> yeah. A strap match, you say. Drew has just run himself into the ground over the last, you know, two, three years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's he's got a bad back, he's got food poisoning. <laughs> His body is absolutely betraying him. Mm-hmm. He's gonna come out here and do a job carrying across in a strap match. Maybe they'll let him take some time off. <laughs> Maybe he'll do like a stretcher job for uh, for carrying here. And uh... hey, man, go home for the holidays. <laughs> yeah, he worked like eight times. To- he would work like three times a night every night last last year during that that holiday house show run because Roman uh, took the holidays off. So, Hey man, take, take a break. Go come back for the rumble. Yes. Oh, you know, I was just thinking, I uh, uh, just, just reminded here. Um, I mean, Becky's going to be coming back any day now. Oh yeah. Um, so if they put her on the, on the baby face side with Bianca and Alexa and Oscar and Candace, um, well, I think Alexa or Oscar is going to turn and uh, and go with the heels. Now that I think about this, that could work. Yeah, I mean, they've never really tried. I mean, I guess Oscar was a heel when she and Kyrie were. What a <laughs> look! I know the sexual harassment is worse, but like if you right. if like top list of reasons why Vince McMahon shouldn't have been allowed to be in charge of WWE no more. <laughs> Having Asuka and Kairi Sane on your roster and making them heels. <laughs> Asuka can make anything work and Kairi can make anything work as it mm-hmm. turns out. They and... were wildly entertaining. <laughs> yeah, but there's never like very few more natural baby faces ever than Kairi Sane. Correct. Yes. And yet... <sighs> But yeah, I guess Oscar hasn't had a singles run as a as a heel in WWE, so that would be, or at least on the uh, on the main roster. So yeah, I think that that could work. Or I mean, Alexa's been they've been like talking lately a bunch about how, or they or at least they mentioned one week on commentary how 
Alexa is like a shell of her former self and doesn't seem to have like a direction. <laughs> so, I mean, they could just have her go back to being like her old heel character and have that be the, the onus for it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it just feels like someone else is coming. It's going to be added to that. And uh, yeah, here we go for war games. Uh, Matt Riddle versus Seth freaking Rollins in a fight pit match with Daniel Cormier as the guest <laughs> referee. This is uh, this is quite a uh, a conglomeration of many different things here. I assume Daniel Cor- Vince just never wanted to use Daniel Cormier because Cormier has wanted to do something with them for like half a decade or more, and uh, they never they never made it work. And then like the third pay-per-view that Vince isn't in charge no more. And uh, Cormier, <laughs> Cormier is in as a guest, as a guest ref. The fight pit is the Triple H, Shawn Michaels, uh, NXT gimmick. It's something. Uh, the psychology of this feud is, is really, has really been bad all along in that uh, Seth Rollins is as wildly entertaining as a heel and Matt Riddle is, to a large portion of the audience, an extremely unlikable baby face. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. uh and those roles have been flipped. And so uh Seth gets cheered. Riddle doesn't get booed really, but Seth definitely gets cheered. And of the two who has more upward mobility, uh we could have argued about this maybe three years ago, but I don't think there's <laughs> any argument that Seth Rollins is a bigger star than Matt Riddle. And Seth Rollins should beat Matt Riddle. But anyway, what are your thoughts on the fight pit and uh, former UFC heavyweight and light heavyweight champion Daniel Cormier getting involved? We, we're going to finally get that Brock Cormier fight, right? Like that uh, that they teased at the UFC show a million years ago. Mm. Um, so, I mean, there's another Saudi show coming up soon. I don't know if they would do that on such a quick turnaround, but uh, I, w- I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the first step to to Daniel Cormier and Brock in some sort of uh, some sort of, of wrestling contest here. But um, yeah, I mean, as, as a, as a match again, feels like it's been going forever <laughs> and uh, you should put some finality on it. So I guess by, by technicality, Riddle is the baby face. So he should probably win this. Um, and, but then Seth is challenging Lashley for the, uh, for the U S title on the, the season premiere of Monday Night Raw next week. Um, of the season premiere of the show that <laughs> never, never ends. Never ends. Interesting, yeah. but uh, always cracks me up when they when they do that. But uh, yeah, so yeah. you would maybe think if if Seth might be winning that match, which I mean I don't know. Lashley as a baby face is fine, but it doesn't really feel like he's got a got a lot of steam behind him and they've been talking about how Seth hasn't hasn't held a championship in a long time so it's like yeah it feels like maybe Seth's gonna win the belt so uh you could maybe want Seth to be strong coming out of that match especially because you don't have a world champion <laughs> right on uh, on your shows every week anymore so you can have Seth be kind of the de facto top heel when Roman's not around with uh, with the US title so yeah, I, I would say for that reason, I would say Seth should win that match and then he should win the US title the next night. And the only other match announced for this show, an extreme rules match for the SmackDown women's title. Liv Morgan defending against Ronda Rousey. They've tried to make Liv look like a killer leading up to this. They've technically done everything um right i would say everything that like if i were trying to get Liv morgan over as a badass tough tough gal they have done everything they should do uh i'm not sure if his clicks is a feud i think there's a they're a very bad match as far as styles and i i don't i don't i i, I don't i don't care for this match <laughs> I, yeah, I don't I don't disagree as far as either trying to make Liv a badass or of her and Ronda just not clicking for I don't know, maybe a wild reason. They just when they're when they're in the same segment, they just seem to have like negative <laughs> chemistry. Like it just 
yeah this doesn't work sometimes opponents have you know you think of you know the great rivalries or even just pretty good rivalries and uh you know generally there's there's some sort of natural connection that these these two adversaries have and it's just these two it's like yeah as far as like the, you know they did the pull apart bra they had you know live like put her through a table the one week and it's and like yeah you're you're doing stuff like that's you're checking the boxes of what you should do for the story you're trying to tell but i think yeah i don't i don't and maybe it's because also because ronda's a real fighter <laughs> or was right um, so trying to convince me that olivia morgan could uh <laughs> could <laughs> could be tough and fight ronda Rousey for real is maybe like i like i said i we we've talked about on the show i'm glad they've at least for the time being, press pause on treating Liv like she's a Make a Wish kid who won a contest to be the, the women's champion. Like they stopped treating her like Yoshihashi, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, one of my favorite bits of yours. <laughs> is yes, that everyone treats Yoshihashi like he's a Make a Wish kid who's really trying his best, even though he's a thirty-eight-year-old man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not very good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad they've moved past that uh, that segment because hey, if she's going to be the champion, she shouldn't be treated like that's. I mean, that was always the disconnect when like Brian Danielson or Rey Mysterio or somebody would win the world title. It was like, well, we still have to book them as the underdog, and it's like, well, no, theoretically, if you're going to have them be the champion, they shouldn't be the underdog, and they should start <laughs> winning all their matches and standing tall in most of their segments and all that stuff. So they're doing. Like you said, they're doing they're doing things right. It's just not clicking, and whether that's more on just this persona also doesn't fit live right. as a as a character, or if it's just strength of opponent. I don't I don't know, but it's it's not uh, it's not gelling. But I think they'll work really hard, and you know, these stipulation matches, Ronda ain't afraid to get the hell beaten out of her. So I think it'll be entertaining at the very least. I'm not sure if they're still going in the direction of Rhonda and Shane as like a heel tag team, but um, yeah, I don't know if they think Rhonda's a heel or not. <laughs> but Hard to say. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but to your point, she will, she, you can never accuse her of, um, of loafing. <laughs> mm-hmm. she, she works, she works real, real hard. So that's nice. All right. Is there anything else you want to discuss? I think we've covered uh, quite a bit this week. No, yeah, yeah. I just think with this Extreme Rules show, it's really interesting that WWE decided to book a show without a main event. Uh, just, <laughs> just, just a bunch of matches, <laughs> and then the show will end. Now, I guess the raw, the raw women's match is the main event, right? Like that's that's the closest thing to a match that feels kind of big, even though again, it's born out of a feud that I think has gotten a little bit stale. The time, the timing is very strange in that I think it's only been it, it it'll end up being like five weeks in between shows, in between mm-hmm. in between their pay per views, but it somehow feels longer. I'm not sure how exactly, and I don't think Bailey has taken a pinfall since she's since she returned from injury. Mm-hmm. But like we've seen, we've seen Dakota pinned, um, we've seen EO pinned. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like her, her, her faction um, does not feel invincible. And so just by association, even though she hasn't taken a loss since she came back, she doesn't feel invincible. <laughs> um, mm. So, and, and I mean, gigantic fan of Bailey but as a human being and as a worker. Mm-hmm. Um, she does not have main event aura about her right now and it's not to say that she won't get there with this character whatever the case may be she's a gigantic star she's extremely talented Mm -hmm. want nothing but the best for her but (laughs) she's not a she does not have main event aura about her and so it doesn't feel like um and bianca belair might have some of that but i think you have to put bianca with the right person Mm-hmm. In order to sell it as a main event, and in that regard, I think that's why this doesn't this doesn't feel like a show with a, with a with a main event. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I think 
Bailey has felt a little bit like uh like like when Jericho came back in like 2007 and sure. he had been gone for a while and you get that initial buzz of hey this person's back but they're for the most part even though she has a you know a slightly different look and and new tag partners she still mostly feels like the same character she was playing before right so i think that's probably part of it too as much fun and as much as she was almost unarguably the wwe mvp of that that thunderdome era um it feels like maybe yeah we need we need something here to freshen up so hey maybe her winning the belt and going on the long reign would help jumpstart that i don't know but yeah as, as of now it feels it feels pretty cold to me yeah all right well uh, enjoy the shows everyone and uh don't get any fights at your workplace and uh <laughs> until next time i meet them i meet them and we'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. R.I.P. Inoki-san. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Thank you for working that in. I almost <laughs> forgot. Inoki-san. Yes. <laughs> Pro wrestling <laughs> is strongest. He was right. As you, as you, as you know him. <laughs> you know him as Inoki-san. Right. <laughs> to me, he's just Antonio Inoki, but you know him as Inoki-san. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> oh, love it. Uh, Fra- Fraser reboot. Yeah, it's a thing. It's happening. I thought I think, maybe uh, it was dead, but it's it's finally it's finally been officially greenlit, right? Yeah, yeah. They ordered episodes, so yeah, it took them like eighteen or nineteen months or something to get the crap all together. And I think they're still. I think this is like when uh, Hogan was doing a tour of Australia and Goldberg. Uh, <laughs> they asked the, everybody's like, "Hey, man, you should really get Goldberg for this thing." And they asked Goldberg about it. He's like, "The old man wanted to keep all the money." <laughs> <laughs> as far as why he wasn't getting involved with uh, Hogan's Australia tour, and it feels like Kelsey Grammer is Hogan in this analogy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, why aren't uh, why aren't any of the any any of the original beloved cast members coming back with them? And it's like, well. The old man wanted to keep keep all the money. <laughs> Yikes. And I don't know that. It just feels like, okay, maybe we have X budget and Kelsey wants X dollars and we're not going to pay X dollars to get uh, Niles and, and Daphne and uh, and Roz back. But, mm-hmm. Which feels feels like a huge miss to me, but I, I also feel like you have to... Um, I'm I'm a little disconcerted also that like none of the original um uh people that produced Cheers and Frasier are attached to this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like going back and watching I've watched some of Cheers. I wa- mm-hmm. made it through like the first 6 seasons or something and I watched I've watched every episode of Frasier and it's just like the continuity was there because it was largely it was a lot of the same people that made both shows and wrote the same character for 21 years or whatever the case was Mm -hmm. and it's like well none of those people are attached to this um so i i i hope it's good (laughs) right i hope it's good yeah like there's gonna be like for people that nobody that liked that show just likes it a little bit you know (laughs) like People that love Frasier really love Frasier. So I feel like people are going to go in wanting to like it. And that right. might be half the battle for it, even if it doesn't have all of the ingredients. I know the guy who played his father has passed away, correct? Correct. Yes. And then the other cast members just aren't coming back. So, right. Well, you know, you've got <laughs> you've got a world of possibilities of where maybe he'll, he'll be living in a different city. Uh, seems likely he's in the witness protection program perhaps also possible <laughs> so you know maybe he's, well, he's living in pyongyang now right well f- from cheers to fraser 
pretty much no characters carried over either. Right. So, uh, like they did, they did cameos, and like once a season, they would have a Cheers character on, and it, uh, to try to pop a rating. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, but like the rest of the cast was just was was made up from scratch. So, yeah, there's reasons to be hopeful. There's reasons to be, um, wary of it. But <laughs> there we go. All right. Fingers crossed. Yes. Any anything that gives us an excuse to dust off Fraser Observer Radio. That's right. It's always uh, that's right. It's a welcome a welcome sight for uh, for my eyes when I saw that that's pop up true. on the timeline this week. That's right. So this show that currently lives in the bonus features of this program <laughs> will continue to do so. By the way, we'd like to congratulate Renee Paquette on her new interview series for the Cincinnati Bengals Renee all day Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that what it's actually called yes Renee all day day spelled D-E-Y because you know the Bengals catchphrases who day ah all right it's very clever (laughs) yeah yeah I I was wondering pun pun very much intended because it's Bengals but like when was when was like a real sports league gonna get their their claws into into her? Because like she that's... did some P, she did some PGA stuff this summer, I think. Ooh, uh, uh, but yeah, she's living in Cincinnati now and uh, doing stuff for the Bengals. So good for her. Just a matter of time. She's gonna be <laughs> she's gonna be on one of those those Stephen A. Smith sports yell shows as as the the woman. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen Charlie on TV in a while. She uh-huh. the ESPN scooped her up for that, and I don't. I think she's still with them, but I haven't seen her for a while. She, she, is she part of like the the Snapchat Sports Center, like they were using Katie Nolan for for a while? Oh, I, I think she, so. She's doing TikTok <laughs> ESPN now. Oh, good lord! <laughs> why? Why has no one ever figured out how to use Katie Nolan <laughs> on television? <laughs> I don't know. She's like one of the it's... most, like the best person at that role. And like Fox gave her that weird late night show that was like the best, somehow the best use of her that there's ever been by one of these networks, but also didn't seem quite right either. Right. Right. They also called the show Garbage. Yes. <laughs> they named the show Garbage Time. <laughs> It's, it's not a bit. They call it garbage time. I, I had forgotten that, but yes, that is in fact the name of that show. Well, the ESPN then gave her a very similar show. The problem is trying to constrain this woman just to sports. So, like, she it was like a it was like a late night show with like a monologue and and like a um, a daily show or in the news mm-hmm. segment or whatever. But it's like all the jokes were. Or like weekend update or something similar. But it's like all the jokes were about sports, and it's just like, you know, sports jokes just ain't that funny. <laughs> which, there is which that. is the problem. Which was the problem. It's like how many you know you gonna make how many puns can you make? <laughs> it's, it's yeah. So you can't just constrain her just to sports. That's a problem. I feel like. Yeah, like maybe she she was like in the wrong era and she didn't like I feel like she needed to make friends with somebody who either knew Jon Stewart or knew Lorne Michaels because that right. seems to be the number one way to get a a yes. non-sports late night show a thousand percent so uh, you know I mean that's true of most industries is if you know and are liked by powerful people you will get further but well, like that. Sim- Bill Simmons is a big fan, and Simmons and Jimmy Kimmel are tight. And Simmons worked for Kimmel for as a writer for years, and uh, it's just like there's only like eight of those jobs, and they're all white guys that have them. Yeah, and you just keep them. You keep them for life, <laughs> pretty much. Right. Well, I guess James Corden. James Corden's getting ready to, to give up his mm-hmm. now, I guess, and uh, the dip. The Daily Show guy is uh, Trevor Noah's walking away now. Mm-hmm. So, I guess a couple of these jobs are opening up. Yeah the uh, <laughs> the tubby kid is leaving <laughs> late late show. 
<laughs> Who's the tubby kid? Yeah. <laughs> uh, James Corden. <laughs> We've been um, rereading the the book about the the Conan <laughs> J uh, fiasco. Tremendous! Um, it's a very good book, and uh, but they've gotten to the part where they're talking about when I didn't know that Dave had Dave's company Worldwide Pants had John Stewart on like a I forget what they call those deals where basically they pay you to not sign anywhere else. A development deal, I think yes. they call it. Yes, so. But there was a fear maybe at some point that he was too similar to Dave and was also younger and more good looking. Yes. And was therefore more of a threat. <laughs> yes. And so they took Kilborn because when the late late when Tom Snyder retired, because Craig Kilborn was type, you know, brand of comedy was not going to ever fly at 1130 on CBS. <laughs> right. Or at least that was that was the the view from 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 i guess people in the industry at the time and i was like that's really fascinating one i didn't know that there was ever a time where john stewart was like that close with that close to like a major talk show i i know like his name would always come up when like anybody was leaving a talk show like i remembered that from maybe the first time i read the book because they talk about him maybe getting conan spot originally or something like that but uh but it, it was just interesting to me, like where <laughs> you think of Dave as just like this institution, but he was also pretty smart about like because he owned the show that came on after him <laughs> about not not setting up his own successor. <laughs> like, yes, it was like when he was done. It's like as much as I loved Craig, like there was never a time where Craig Ferguson was going to get eleven thirty, like. That was never going to happen. If he had, if he had hosted that show for fifteen years, he wouldn't have gotten it. So it's like too wacky, right? And it's, it's and it's the same. You know, I think it's the same reason. Maybe lo- maybe long term, if they had given him a chance, Conan would have settled into that eleven thirty thing. But I think there was always something about like what people that watch <laughs> eleven thirty late night talk shows want that guys like that don't quite fit into and. So it's like, yeah, Dave, but I, I thought that was interesting. It's like, you just always think of Dave as like this untouchable institution. And yet it's like, no, he was also very like the the foresight to like own the show that came on after him was really, really smart. And like decide who would get, <laughs> who would be behind him and who would be right. getting promoted and all of that stuff is like, that's really, really smart on his part. Cause that meant... Oh he got to have that job as long as he wanted to. And then when, yep. <laughs> when he was done there, you know, he just lit a match and, and walked away. Like it was <laughs> one his problem. Well, it was, it was Johnny Carson deal and Johnny Carson had that deal at NBC mm-hmm. and Carson owned. Um, Carson did not own the time slot because Letterman uh, Letterman's production company still owned. Uh, I, I, Carson did own the times or Carson did have the say over who came on after him uh, mm-hmm. on NBC and Carson owned his show the way that Letterman owned his show. So when, well, when Letterman went to CBS, he got the, he got the Carson deal, which just considering the lever, uh, he, he, it's amazing that he had that much leverage. <laughs> let's just, let's just say, yeah, but also, I don't necessarily disagree with your assessment and the, the book's assessment that um, he picked Kilborn for um, the time slot after because he was less of a threat or less similar than Jon Stewart was. There is something to that. I would also offer um, that... I mean, John Stewart at that point had had the John Stewart show on MTV. I think it was on MTV. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had been canceled. Yes. And Kilborn, Kilborn was on the Daily Show. Mm-hmm. And and Kilborn had kind of, I don't want to say Kilborn was bigger than Stewart because they're very much like in the 80s when there was just a sense of 
Letterman is going to happen in the 90s. There was a sense of, oh, John Stewart's going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just a, it was just a matter of finding the right vehicle for him. Right. But you could argue, I mean, you, you could you could argue the Kilborn was bigger than Stewart for a minute until Stewart got on the Daily Show. And then it was uh, Stewart made that show, you know, bigger than Kilborn ever made it. But mm-hmm. yeah, you can you can argue that, oh, yeah. Kilborn was bigger than Stewart at the time. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's very funny now. <laughs> yes. What what happened to like what is Kilborn? He started a podcast. Oh, good. I haven't listened to it yet, but uh, it's called The Life Gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I don't know. Could could the actual podcast be better than just knowing <laughs> that Craig Kilborn has a podcast called The Life Gorgeous? That's kind of why I haven't listened to it yet. <laughs> <laughs> It's like I'm sure you know it's gonna be he he's really he's on Instagram he's really good on Instagram by the way mm-hmm. <laughs> okay just, I gotta follow him then. Uh, yeah uh, it's just a, it's pompous white guy shtick mm-hmm. like n- n- not many people are doing that anymore <laughs> but pomp pompous chauvinistic white guy shtick is is can be really really funny. <laughs> and uh and that's kind of what he's doing but I, I, and i assume that's continuing when you name your show the life gorgeous yes <laughs> but on his instagram he does a lot of videos talking about like his chocolate brown loafers and <laughs> and his uh window pane blazers and <laughs> and i was watching you know Cary grant movies and that kind of thing it's like there's a, there's a brand there that no one's really doing anymore, so that works. I love that. Love that for him. There's a piece there that I don't understand though, because he hasn't worked since like 2004. <laughs> <laughs> it's like how how do you you know maintain a wealthy lifestyle mm-hmm. not working for like you know the prime earning years of your life between ages like 40 and 60 when you're supposed to when you you it's your last window to make money and also generally it's your best opportunity to make money because Mm -hmm. you're in a a window where like you're usually in a job where you get paid more or whatever and it's just like he just didn't work (laughs) (laughs) he didn't work for for 18 years that is... There's a piece I don't understand. Like I don't know if he comes comes from a wealthy family, like a really wealthy family, or or what what the deal is. But he, he didn't have to heiress. work for 18 years. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think he's ever been married. Okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, there's a piece there, but I don't understand. Interesting. He maybe he was really smart with his ESPN and Daily Show money. I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. he invested well. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I guy, don't under, I don't guy, understand that. guys in that industry don't generally just completely disappear for <laughs> for for two decades. He did try to come back about ten years ago with a like a syndicated talk show. Okay, and which made me think, which made me think it it didn't get picked up. Mm-hmm. Um, but it made me they like ran it in uh like five they tested it in like five or six different market markets. Like the way that Jay Leno show is. Is mm-hmm. on <laughs> now. They tested a Kilborn show like ten years ago, and but it didn't get picked up. So mm. I th- thought maybe like ten years ago. Oh, he needs money now, finally. But then he didn't <laughs> do anything after that. So, so I've uh, I've been listening. I know you're always t- talking to me about you. You take these nine hour walks with your dog every night. Yes, and uh, you're looking for things to listen to. Have you listened to any of Conan's podcasts? No. Like it has to be with the right guests. I like to. <laughs> To specify that, because like there's, I feel like more modern people that he has on that I have no interest in hearing him talk to. Sure, sure. If you get him in there with like, like I was listening to one, I had to drive to Bowie. To Ugh. Uh, My condolences. Yeah, no, terrible, terrible, <laughs> terrible way to get there because every highway in Maryland is constantly under construction. And then also just that town, there is one road. There's one road going south and one road going north. And that is how you get everywhere. And it is constantly cluttered and terrible. But 
that being that as it may, I had a longer commute. I was listening to him talk to Dana Carvey on his show today. And I was like, that's, that's the sweet spot for Conan's show is when he has like a guy from his era. <laughs> right. Right. And they, they just like wax poetic about comedy and show business. I'm like, this is where this show, this show lives. I don't need to hear him talk to like John Mulaney, you know, even though I think Conan is funny and I think, John Mulaney can be funny. It's like, I don't need those guys talking to each other. That doesn't interest me, but give me one of them old heads. I understand that. Sure. And uh, I think it works. But the reason that I've, uh, what I really zeroed in on is Conan has to do ad reads now. Right. <laughs> and so he's doing one for, it's like the United Association of Realtors, I think. <laughs> And part of the sales pitch is, well, realtors aren't the same thing as real estate agents because realtors, you know, they have this and they have this and they're an accredited association and they, have, they, they adhere to a strict code of ethics. And he just does this little aside where he's like, you know, there's a lot of people out there uh, not so not so great in the ethics department, but not realtors. <laughs> <laughs> and he just moves on with the rest of the sales pitch. But I was like that little aside of, of oh, a lot of unethical people out there, but not realtors. <laughs> Tremendous. Maybe better than anything in the actual podcast to me. Oh, that's I, good. I rewound his realtor ad like three <laughs> times. <laughs> I try to keep on keeping on.